Buonasera a tutti. Hello everyone. Welcome to State of the Net 2015. Uh, we are very happy to be here with you. Uh, this year, we pick a, a keyword very popular these days, algorithms. And algorithms will, ju just now in these days, uh, shape our world and the algorithms we are going to write will shape our future. So it's kind of popular these days and, and we would like to investigate and go on uh, studying what will, what will happen in, in, in the future. We, as, as you know, State of the Net is a conference that was made in Friuli Venezia Giulia. You, you know, uh, me, Paolo, and Sergio are, are from, from Friuli Venezia Giulia, and we are quite proud of that tiny and fantastic region. We launched the conference in 2008, and every year uh, it came growing. Uh, this time, uh, we decided to to try a new one and to be here in Milan. If you think about Friuli Venezia Giulia, it's somehow at the center of Europe. But this year, Milan, thanks to the global exposition, seems to be at the center of the world. So we, it was the right year to, to try a new, a new place to be. And uh, actually, this place, uh, this beautiful square outside here, is a symbol of the new Milan, so we are happy to be here. Uh, we, we have many things to, to say before starting. Uh, the first one goes to the uh, autonomous region, the local government of Friuli Venezia Giulia that is uh, still supporting this conference, and this conference is part of the program of uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia events in Milan 2015. And the second one, of course, is our host today. Uh, they knew about State of the Net and they built this beautiful place. No, I'm joking, but it's very, a beautiful location. So thank you, Unicredit, the whole team of Unicredit and Unicredit Pavilion that has worked a lot for, for this conference. We'll have one evening of true conversation and a uh, whole day of panels and keynotes. So, Sergio. So welcome, welcome to you and to people connected uh, from home. We are live streaming State of Net uh, on our website, sotten.it, and uh, on YouTube. On YouTube, remember, you can find uh, all the history of State of Net. Uh, or every single session and speaker from the conference are available on, uh, on YouTube and uh, Sutton uh, 15 uh, will be as well. Uh, some useful information, remember please the hashtag if you tweet or, or, or share contents on Facebook, the hashtag is uh, Sutton 15. Uh, maybe uh, you want to know the password for the Wi-Fi. Uh, there is a, a, a net uh, called uh, St State of a Net, uh, and the password is, I lost it, uh, uh, Sutton PV 2015. Sutton like State of a Net, PV like Pavilion or Paolo Valdemarin, <laughs> and 2015 like the year, of course. Yeah. Uh, this year we are going to have, we are an international conference, we're going to have people from a lot of countries. Uh, we have registration, uh, we had the registration from Norway, Germany, Switzerland, the UK, Sweden, Israel, uh, Iran, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Ireland, Albania, and also from Brazil and United States, but I want to see them in the eyes before. <laughs> uh, let me greet also our steering committee. They help us uh, to build the conference uh, during the year between the events, and they are very patient. People. Uh, Ion Sempo, Luca De Biase, Gigi Taglia Pietra, Adriana Lucas, Marco Massarotto, Antolena Laponitano, Daniele Chieffi, Mafia De Baggis, Massimo Russo, Tom Zilstra, and in some possible way, I'm sure, also our friend uh, uh, Marco Zamperini. You too are very patient people, but 
you will reward it because after this session, this open session tonight, we're going to have a, a aperitif with a speaker outside in the square at the Illy Cafe. Paolo? Okay, so what is going to happen here tonight? Um, you know when you go to a conference and at some point there is somebody who says, uh, oh, we were just having a conversation last night at dinner and somebody said something interesting. And you were not part of the conversation because you were not at dinner and you have no idea what really happened. Well, this is that previous night. This is where we're going to start that conversation with all the speakers, with all the people that are already available here in Milano. And we are going to uh, have a very simple and open chat and uh, draw some inspirations that hopefully will make tomorrow an even better conference. We are going to talk about uh, algorithms. Uh, what are algorithms? Tomorrow we will discuss that in great detail. Just to, to make a long story very short, uh, if you ever created a simple spreadsheet to manage your expenses, well, you created a little algorithm. If you, if you created some calculation, that is an algorithm. It's a rule. It's something that takes some data and changes it. Uh, algorithm you can use uh, are used for calculation. They are used for data analysis, and this is uh, uh, very very important because today we are creating more data than ever in the history of humanity. And algorithms are becoming smarter and smarter, so they st are starting to become intelligent. They help us making decisions. So. When you run a search on, on Google, the logic that decides what is at the top of that page is an algorithm, is the algorithm, algorithm that made Google the company it is today. If you go on Facebook and uh, you uh, see some posts from your friends, there is an algorithm that decides uh, what you're going to see. And it is working, it's very effective. There is 1.5 billion people using it. Uh, no piece of software has ever been touching so many people all at the same time. But it's becoming more and more present. It's not just stuff happening in our, in our, on our screens. It's, uh, uh, you know, we have algorithms In microphones, no. Yeah, we have algorithms in microphones. Uh, Google is making a self-driving car. Uh, Volkswagen is making a cheating car. Uh, Apple will be, we don't know, but it's going to be cool, and we're all going to want it. Uh, and it will be based on some algorithms. And these algorithms will decide if they want to save our life when the car is about to crash. I mean, it's going to be very important stuff. And moving forward, and tomorrow we'll have some very interesting example and discussion around it, we're going to have more and more intelligent uh, algorithms. Uh, some say that a whole number of type of jobs will disappear in just a few years. Uh, maybe there won't be lawyers anymore because, uh, you know, you can do it with a computer. Uh, maybe there will be lawyers. We don't know. We, we kind of hope not, but <laughs> who knows. Uh, in any case, algorithms are everywhere, and uh, the whole reason of tomorrow conference is to explore uh, all many different uh, angles of this technology. Uh, but tonight, we'll just start in having start with a conversation. So we will be inviting the the, the speakers and the members of the committee that are already present here today, uh, and uh, each one of them will introduce themselves. So, oh, please, why don't we start from you on? The oldest member of the committee that <laughs> has been... <laughs> In our history. Thanks, Paolo. So let's, um, let's have a seat. Sit down, okay. As was the case last year, uh, when I was told to speak very slowly and very carefully, <laughs> which was very well received by the audience, <laughs> I'm going to do the same again. But um, just briefly, um, I've been involved, I think, from the first of uh, State of the Net, and um, get so much from the conversations that we have around the topics that are, are, are chosen. 
And uh, I think it's the combination of technologists, ideologists, uh, creative people and business people that, that, that makes it so special. So uh, I'm actually just hosting a conversation at the end of tomorrow, uh, but thoroughly looking forward to it. Um, let's have one of the Lees. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Lee Rainey. I'm from the United States in Washington, D.C. And I run a research organization that looks at how people use technology and especially its social impact. We look at how people's use of technology affects their health care, the way they interact with other people in their community, the way they interact with their government, the way they form learning communities, and of course the social impact of the internet. So I have the best job in the world. I don't have to make any money because I am funded by a wonderful foundation. And maybe you can tell I'm from New York. So like you and I speak really fast most times. Someone told me that I should slow down because my normal speaking speed is the same speed that someone reads the after effects and side effects of medicines. You know in those ads when they go so fast? So I, I've been told this. I'm sorry I do this. It's part of my genetic makeup. And I'm looking forward to talking slowly and smartly with you tomorrow. I'm so impressed with the, with the other panelists here. I hope I can make my contribution too. Thank you. It, it was like years we were trying to, to have uh, pure research at the conference because you you didn't mention <laughs> the name actually and we're glad that uh, Lee could make it this year so thank you we go on with Tom maybe Tom Zistra we have a fun club Buonasera. good evening um, my name is Tom um, I'm from the Netherlands and I will be hosting a panel discussion tomorrow. Um, most of my work is in open data. I help governments open up data as a, uh, basically as a, as a shared resource uh, for individuals and organizations. And a lot of usage that is being made of that data is through algorithms. Now, I don't know anything about algorithms, really. So I'm really curious to hear what will be presented um, here at the, at the conference. But I'm interested in it from a perspective of agency. How does it change the way that we as individuals or as individuals as part of groups can act? And how does it change the way that we can decide things? And I would be worried if algorithms were only about making decisions about me or for me. So I'm interested in the angle of how does it change the way that you and I can make our shared decisions. Thank you. Yeah, we stay. Oh, you want to stay there? Okay. Yeah. Lee Bryant? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lee Bryant, another Lee. Um, I'm interested in the future of organizations, and tomorrow I'll be talking about um, organizations in the age of the algorithm. In other words, how do we build uh, simultaneously more human networked organizations, but also organizations that work for a post-human future. Uh, in other words, a world where machines and humans are at work together. Thank then you. We have Giampiero. Giampiero. Giampiero Riva. Good evening. My name is Giampiero. And I have the problem of the other hand, because uh, saying that English is not my mother language is like an euphemism, you know. So, so I don't know how tomorrow I will um, tell you about algorithms, because uh, my speech, uh, I, um, what I am, I am just a, a nerd, or better as manettone, and so uh, I think that um, my speech uh, will be focused on uh, the idea of uh, how, in which way, algorithms um, changed my life in many, many, many phases, okay? And so I will try to uh, involve you in this um, adventure. Thank you. Thank you, Giampiero. David?
Uh, hello, everybody. My name is David Orban. Uh, I have been a friend and a follower of uh, State of the Net for many, many years. And I have always wanted to come, but it was too far. So now that it is closer, uh, I am very, very happy to be here and to be able to, to, to talk to you. Um, uh, actually, uh, as it happens sometime, I came to sell you my book. And uh, we agreed with Paolo that you will not be able to leave uh, unless you show the proof of purchase of the book tomorrow. Uh, I will be talking about uh, artificial intelligence and how we must uh, have the courage to open a broad and a deep global conversation about the necessity of a science and an engineering of morality and how unless that conversation happens and we have global agreements on how it should uh, happen, uh, our ambitions of building a more and more complex and ambitious um, global civilization are going to be hampered and potentially stopped in their tracks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, starting from... <laughs> oh, sorry. We have now. Welcome. Hello, everybody. My name is Nicola Bianati. I am from Italy, and uh, I'm with DNI, that is the Italian oil company. And in the last 15 years, my previous job has been developing the algorithms that uh, we use to convert seismic data into subsurface images. And you, I think, uh, for me, it's pretty obvious why we do so. We, because we, before starting drilling a new well looking for oil and gas, we need to know how to drill the well. Because uh, it's very expensive, it's risky, and we have to take every precaution to, for this well to be successful and safe. And every day for doing that, uh, we work on terabytes of data. And to convert uh, this data into images, we use a lot of computing power. So we talk about petaflops. If someone knows what is a petaflop, it's something in the order of 10 to the 15 operations per second. So every day I use special supercomputers to convert uh, this data into subsurface images. And tomorrow I will show you what we can do, what we get, and how we, do, we use those images. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. So I'm, I'm starting with a, a question, a, a point uh, that goes here between you, so how organizations change? You, you, you do both, your work uh, is focused on organizations. How algorithms are changing the way we work and, and live with other people? You can choose if you want to start or, or leave the mark to, to, to Lee. Well, just picking up on the, the comment about morality, um, I write a lot about the ideology of algorithms, that there, there's sort of almost no such thing as a neutral algorithm. And the algorithms that Paolo was talking about, deciding whether your car goes off the road or the person coming in the other direction crashes, you know, that has to be decided by somebody somewhere. By humans. Who have a context, who have priorities, who have maybe a different culture. and. It really worries me that we are, I think, potentially sleepwalking into quite a dystopian future where those things are just buried so deep in systems that we've forgotten they're there, but have a huge impact on, on how we live. Yes, yeah, so I think I would agree with that. I think that's a really important um, point. But I think there's another angle to this that I'm very interested in, which is that um, you know, throughout human history, uh, people have got together in various types of structure, whether that's religious structures, whether that's uh, feudal structures, companies, organizations, governments, and so on. And, um, and when people join together in positive ways, they can do anything. Uh, they can achieve absolutely anything. And yet we've lived through the last sort of 50, 60, 70 years where most people work in very dysfunctional organizations. Uh, you know, stupid corporate structures which are really backward, which are really bureaucratic, uh, the same with governmental structures and so on. And yet now we have the, the realistic possibility 
um, of organizing ourselves together on a peer-to-peer -peer basis in much more effective and much more interesting ways, which are fundamentally human, because we're not giving authority to a system above us, uh, we're constructing authority from ourselves and from our networks. So that's the, the main interest I've had for the last 15 years or so. But then the question is, in the age of algorithms, uh, you know, when we're dealing with these cars and we're dealing with the software and we're dealing with these, these other things, um, that poses an, an entirely new challenge to how we organize human structures um, because you know, we need to keep up with the speed and we need to keep up with the sheer scale of data um, that's flowing through our operations and our organizations. So I think it's sort of an interesting question just to say, what would an organization look like which is populated partly by humans partly by bots, uh, and part, partly by software. Uh, and so that's an interesting uh, question, I think. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if you have some questions, please say hi. Uh, OK, just, in, just a second. Just, just to briefly pick you up on, not, not disagreeing necessarily, but the, and I, I, I also perceive most of our big organizations as dysfunctional. But they didn't become that way because people were stupid or, or ill-intentioned. And I'm also wary of sometimes falling into cyber utopianism, that once we have a different technology, we'll some, we will somehow become different people. How do we avoid replicating the same mistakes again? Possibly it's a question for tomorrow, but since you were talking about organizations and algorithms, uh, most people f are afraid of artificial intelligence in organizing people. Perhaps it's a too big a question, but that's a question that came from, from my heart. It, it, just to answer that briefly, I think uh, people are right to be afraid of artificial intelligence in, in, in many ways. Um, but I think what's more interesting than artificial intelligence is what we call augmented human intelligence. In other words, using the power of machines and software to just give us assistance. You know, so when we look at something like uh, Siri on the Apple iPhone, it's not very scary. It's sort of helping us find where we need to go using all of this uh, computing power. And if you look at some of the early applications of Watson from IBM and other systems, I think where they're most interesting um, is when they augment human intellect and support people rather than try and replace them. Um, and I think those two concepts are quite important uh, to, under to understand. And I, I guess you agree with that as well. Um, I am one of the signatories of the open letter that uh, the MIT issued about the dangers of artificial intelligence. And as many of us who signed that letter, I didn't do it so that the research would be stopped as uh, mainstream media uh, liked to uh, report on it, but in order to understand that we have the chance of evolving uh, smarter solutions to our problems if we have an open eye on, on the issue. When agriculture was invented, uh, the lives of the human individuals got shorter. When the industrial age came, uh, whoever lived in London during the 1800s lived a, a very, very bad life for decades. And only after working out what were the problems of one or the other of these revolutions, things got better. But the problem is that the power of unfettered AI could be so deep and, and, and so uh, unstoppable that it's like an airplane that is in a deep dive and after minus 10 meters, its uh, trajectory is going to go up, but you don't survive minus 10 meters of an airplane trajectory, right? Uh, so that is what we must avoid in order to uh, bridge to a future situation where we can fully either exploit AI or live together with AI. I'd like. There is, there, there yeah. is a, a, an interesting article I read a while back saying that the big, the biggest challenge we have with AI is that we must create something that we have never done, uh, which is an intelligence that uh, cares for a simpler form of life. 
And uh, but we're not very good at doing that. Usually we tend to destroy everything else. Talking about uh, perception, because if you think about people frightened by these teams and by these developments, I'd like to ask uh, Lee Rainey, um, you do study how people uh, use the networks, the internet, and, and how is people, uh, are we uh, actually afraid of, of what's going on and, or, or not? Or are, are we in some way um, up to date uh, with this huge development? People have very mixed feelings about technology. They can see on the one hand quite clearly how it serves their needs, makes their lives better, helps them make better decisions, all kinds of ways makes things more efficient, more convenient, and, and sometimes even more satisfying. At the same time, they are frantically worried about the future that's been described here and also the things that are present right now. There, there are not good ways that we deal with online abuse and harassment. There are not good ways that we can't disengage from our screens. They're very compelling and mesmerizing to people, and that's a concern that we're becoming distracted to death. There are ways that, um, that humans are not nice to each other. You know, as, as much as some of the best social things about technology scale really fast, the worst parts of human behavior, hate and abuse, and stealing from each other, making each other's lives miserable. So people have very mixed emotions. Right now, in America at least, when we ask them essentially to conduct a, a balance sheet, does the good outweigh the bad or the bad outweigh the good? The good outweighs the bad for them. But they are really worried about this future and about other things that just seem um, not quite human. Uh, mixed emotion as in the movie of uh, Pixar. <laughs> At the end of the movie, the girl gained the, the, the capacity to, to uh, manage mixed emotion, if you have uh, seen the movie. I have three kids, so I have seen the movie. <laughs> uh, are there differences between generations? What about the young people uh, in comparing uh, to, to adults? or in different parts of the world. You're, you're a global institute, you study all uh, the continents. Are, do you perceive differences between, the, between uh, ages and, and locations? Yes. Uh, technological change is very often driven by generational change. So young people around the world have a very different relationship to technology that has been part of their lives since they were conscious. And, and they feel a little bit more attached to young, to young people around the world than previous generations did. So there's a lot of really interesting hope that would come from that. Um, and they're teaching their parents uh, in many respects that, that some of the best things, but the parents are quite worried and, and young people have both the highest highs and the lowest lows with these technologies. It's, so it's, they're struggling in ways, in some respects, that their parents cannot help them because these are new aspects of the human condition. Some parts of our past can be brought to bear to help people, but a lot of times it's so new that basic rules from the past don't easily get lifted into this future. Um. At the uh, Chaos uh, Computer Club conference in Berlin, um, I think almost 10 years ago now, um, Bre Pettis, who then went on to found uh, MakerBot, and now he is uh, out of that after having sold it, uh, had a slide that became um, one of my favorite. And it says, things change faster than we can die. And, and some, somewhat that is the point that uh, it was relatively easy to adapt to the changes when they spanned generations. But compressed accelerated change now requires older people to keep up. And uh, various kinds of childlike behavior or things like uh, disrespect for authority or um, um, risk-taking, 
uh, or acceptance of uh, uh, challenge and curiosity in, in adult life are actually an evolutionarily adaptive behavior in a, in a time like ours. Uh, we have a question here, but we have to welcome uh, uh, another speaker joined us. Uh, it's Vittorio Carlini, if you want to join us on, on the stage, please. Okay. Um, a quick question that links to uh, the last part of the conversation, uh, and it's about education. We were worried about educating kids uh, to make them adults. So there were rules that the adults were teaching to the kids. Now we have a new problem. We need to teach adults a new way of living and new approach to artificial intelligence and proper behaving and whatever. So. Is there any general trend, or do you recognize some patterns in which eventually algorithm or programs can help adults in get taught in that new behaviors in this new world? Can I just, as the sort of resident silver surfer in the audience, in the, in the stage, um, well, both of us, yeah, I guess, I'm not entirely convinced about the age Thing. You know, I think youngsters have a facility with the technologies that maybe some of my generation struggle with. But it sort of doesn't mean that they understand the best, most effective use of those technologies. And I think there was a whole mythology around Generation Y coming into the workplace who were going to suddenly transform things. But they haven't. They're very, they're very cautious and conservative in many ways. So I think it's more interesting to talk about open and closed attitudes maybe to change than necessarily about age. And it would be a shame if we suddenly assumed that all the old people needed taught by the young people, because I don't think that's true. I, uh, I agree with that. But I think there's another paradox in that uh, age relationship, which is that um, you know, my father, right, he knew how to take a car apart and put it back together, and he understood everything about the car. I know nothing about the car, because the car is a, a black box. It just works. And so that means that if the manufacturer puts some bad things in there or puts some moral assumptions or some behaviors, I have no idea what's going on. And it's a bit like that with computers um, because, you know, um, you know, if you're old enough that you needed to hack computers and write code in order for them to do something, you have an understanding. You know, you have a base understanding of how these things work. Whereas my, my daughters, who use these devices all the time and also study algorithms and computing, have absolutely no idea how they work. They just accept them. And so there's something of a danger there, and there's also a lack of knowledge actually there. Um, and so I think you know, we need, as Ewan said, we need a combination of some very old, wise, experienced uh, brains you know, with some young brains, and maybe it's the bit in the middle um, that's being slightly disintermediated um, by what's going on today. Um, uh, one, of, one of the reasons, oh, I'm sorry, one of the reasons uh, why what you just said is so relevant and tragic is because a lot of this ignorance is self-inflected. If you tried to understand how your, machine, how your car works, you would be sued uh, under the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act that prohibits looking into things. Uh, and we have all been made criminals uh, in the past 10, 15 years through unnecessarily restrictive legislation that imposes ignorance on, on everybody. Um, I'd like to connect your question to what David said earlier about the speed of change in technology and sort of catching up with our lives. Um, I, in, my, in my environment and when I look at my parents or my family, I basically see two things. One is that the speed of change, you can only really keep up with it if you're willing to experiment. And that willingness to experiment is not something that is uh, generation specific, but is whether you've accepted the lesson to not experiment uh, in school over time, yes or no. Uh, so that's more about attitude and, and um, uh, openness. Um, and the other thing I just now forgot while I was formulating my <laughs> sentence, but I'll come back to that later. <laughs> I have a question. Maybe I need an algorithm for that to keep check on my notes. Can I say something about, because 
um, in everyday life, uh, I, I see another problem. Uh, I have observed this problem uh, uh, affecting my friends. I am a father, I have already said it, but uh, I have friends with kids. And um, I can observe that now, um, often parents cannot, uh, you know, uh, generation by generation, parents uh, were able to teach uh, their kids to cross the street, okay? Because streets uh, were always the same, changed perhaps the material, changes the cars, the, the speed of the cars, but uh, the concept was the same. Now I see that parents cannot uh, teach uh, their kids to cross the digital street. And often happens that uh, they switch off the computer because they have they are uh, uh, they are afraid about uh, uh, this this field. Okay, and switching off the computer, they are limiting the possibility to their kids, uh, kids that that are eight years old, for example. And uh, my my daughter at eight years old is able to program, and I think this uh, uh, she is a step uh, forward uh, compared with uh, their friends. So, and maybe uh, also compared to, to to us, because. <laughs> in, in the meantime, I remembered my second remark to you. Uh, um, what you asked about people, I think, is also true for institutions. Um, um, you know, the, the willingness to experiment there, and are they sort of you know uh, uh, ready and open for change? I work a lot with governments. In part, they are designed not to change. We created them as stable structures. Um, uh, they only can sort of change if they are willing to experiment. And in the sort of sea of change in technology, what I often see is that they don't really know what to choose to experiment with. So they go with the latest fad, but not with the latest significant change in technology. So there's a question. question. Hello, buonasera. Um, I'm Alessandro Melletti de Palo. I was at, uh, in the Silicon Valley at the last uh, conference on collective intelligence. Um, I'm interested uh, in cooperation and uh, I am a leader of uh, independent researchers team. Uh, my question is about the blockchain coming back to algorithms and uh, we were interested about the blockchain because it self-enforces uh, trust. So the, the, the part of, uh, of the law that can be embedded in the blockchain and that can be a solution for uh, giving trust to the population uh, uh, is very important for us because uh, trust is one of the main principles that lead to cooperation. So uh, the question is, uh, are you going to talk about uh, blockchain tomorrow? Some, who of you or? Um, I did not finish my slides yet. So yes, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yes, anyway, just we, one we, slide we actually about have blockchain. One, one slide. <laughs> we actually have one more speaker who will speak in speci specifically about blockchain technology. Oh, good. Uh, so I know the question now could be, what do you think about it? Well, um, in, in some sense, um, the blockchain can be more important than the internet. Um, because... David, can you tell... Oh, us. sorry, sorry. Um, In like a sentence, what, what blockchain is. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, can you raise your hand if you have heard of Bitcoin? Okay. Wow. So, uh, wonderful. Uh, email is to all the things that we see on the internet now, as Bitcoin is what we are going to build in the next 10 years. There will be really hundreds and thousands of amazing new ways of building um, into our smart infrastructure things that we're not, we were not capable of, of, of building in. Uh, the simplest example is payments. Payments on the net are still a pain. They are still cumbersome, slow. Uh, the reason you pay $1 or, or one euro for a song on, on uh, Apple Music is not because there aren't any artists who wouldn't want to sell it for 10 cents, but because it is too hard to sell it for 10 cents. 
and even Apple cannot solve it. But payments are just the first step. And as you very rightly said, even money is just a proxy, an extremely primitive proxy for trust, reputation, and authority. And we will be able to design better ways to allocate resources to people and organizations that deserve those resources based on automated ways of deciding what should be done. And whether it is the Internet of Things, whether it is going to Mars, whether it is uh, um, designing new types of societies that are more just and more inclusive and more empowering than we have today, these are all going to be um, made more likely if they include blockchain technologies. Do, do you see, you know, when, when I look as, a, as an outsider towards blockchain, I see two things that, that interest me. One is that Bitcoin as a, as a unit of currency is presented as something that's very distributed, but by now that the computing power needed to sort of keep track of the public ledger is so large that it actually has consolidated into five or six large computing efforts to, to, to verify the ledger. That's basically a re-centralization of something that was designed to be d distributed. Mm -hmm. So basically you're creating new clearing houses. And uh, from what I've seen from those, I have no way to trust any of them uh, that are doing the computing right now. Um, and the other thing is that if I look at any technology, including blockchain, I'm always interested in how can I use it myself. So I would be interested in using blockchain, a public ledger of trust, for instance, only with my peer network, not some global ledger of keeping track of anybody's uh, sort of trust factor, but just with my peer network or just with my local exchange or trading circle or just with my neighborhood. Um, is there already on the horizon anything in terms of blockchain that allows me to, to, to deploy something like that at a, at a smaller scale within my own social circles? Um, would you like to intervene? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a really fascinating topic, and I think um, in some ways I agree with you, and in some ways, this is to you, David, some ways I agree with you, in some ways I completely disagree, um, because I think we're in danger of massively overstating uh, the, the short, -term, short to medium term impact of, of blockchain. I think blockchain is interesting. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin is not uh, a currency. Uh, Bitcoin has none of the stability of a, of a currency. It's an asset. No, no, but, but really, you, you cannot, from an economic point of view, you cannot consider Bitcoin as a currency at the moment. It's an asset. And it's an asset that massively advantages early geeks who were early miners who had a very low cost of production. So I don't think it's necessarily a fantastic thing. And also the head of, you know, number of Bitcoin exchanges have basically been crooks who've wandered off with, you know, millions of dollars of other people's um, assets. So even a technology like blockchain, which is supposedly... Uh, neutral, it's supposedly impersonal, it's supposedly you know, irreversible encryption, etc. Humans will find ways to fuck it up, basically. Uh, that's the core of my argument, I think, against blockchain. But also with blockchain, why is the computational cost uh, of the irreversible encryption so high? You know, that has everything from environmental impacts through to, as Ton said, you know, the danger of a re-centralization. So the basic concept of using irreversible encryption to create a ledger that cannot be reversed or undone is an interesting one, and it gets really interesting in contract law. So we talked about disintermediating uh, lawyers. It's not so much lawyers, it's actually disintermediating central authorities. So, you know, why is a bank the authority of, uh, of the creation of money, yet we know that they can't be trusted. You know, why is uh, a legal institution uh, or a government, you know, the arbiter of what's legally correct, even though we know they can't be trusted as well? So as a way of putting trust into the people and into networks, that's theoretically very, very interesting indeed. And I think, you know, Bitcoin will, will in many ways be a sideshow compared to the stuff you can build with Ethereum and you can build with these emerging technologies around, you know, distributed ledgers, uh, you know, reducing the need for sort of imperfect trust and so on. But I am skeptical that this is going to really change the world in the next, in the next period of time um, because, you know, we've seen it with everything from, you know, the segue onwards. Uh, you know, we have these, these sort of utopian beliefs that something will change everything. But one of the enduring characteristics of human society 
um, is it's messy and it's very slow you know, to take on these things and actually it won't be as, as impactful, I think, um, as we might hope at this point. Um, I do love that you have many things to say, but I, I was, uh, I noticed uh, Vittorio Carlini uh, laughing <laughs> about something when we were talking about Bitcoin. Oh, I, so I, I, I didn't laugh. Somehow, no, no, no. Vittorio, so please introduce yourself. Vittorio is a financial journalist for Sole 24 Ore, and, and he will present a paper uh, and talk about uh, economics and financial algorithms tomorrow. Uh, what was your laugh about? No, 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 I, I didn't laugh. I, I don't, don't say that I laugh. No, I was surprised also um, when I, I'm in a Congress, a conference like this, uh, among uh, people who know a lot of things about uh, technology, etc. Uh, and uh, they speak about uh, uh, finance. I think that it's very difficult uh, uh, to uh, summarize uh, all the problems that are uh, linked uh, with uh, um, connected with the two part uh, uh, of our uh, society. Um, uh, people before uh, spoke about Bitcoin, and uh, well, I'm uh, surprised because Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Uh, when you speak about uh, of Bitcoin, uh, you have al you always have to remember, for example, that uh, a currency needs. Uh, uh, um, free um, element. Uh, first of all, a reserve of value. Uh, if you uh, take uh, a dollar, you know that uh, uh, the dollar is used by a Federal Reserve, and uh, Bitcoin is used by who? For, for, first of all, so this, this, this is, is a real question. This is the trust point. This is a real question. Bitcoin has not a very certain value. This is a great problem. When technological people used to speak about this asset, according to me, should remember that there is not only the technological aspect. There is another word that is very, 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 very important. Because always I am afraid of all that people that uh, used to say, oh, what a fantastic uh, uh, way of payment, Bitcoin. Okay, then, as uh, people um, uh, remember it, uh, there, there were a lot of bankruptcy, a lot of uh, people uh, lost their money, and it was a great problem. It could be Bitcoin only a, a way of payment. I don't know. It could be. It, the other element for a currency is uh, that you use for calculate. I give you one dollar, and uh, uh, so I can understand that that uh, goods, uh, the value of that goods is one dollar. Okay, mm -hmm. but uh, where is in Bitcoin the reserve value? According to me, there is no very reserve value because um, the Bitcoin has not a Federal Reserve or a European Central Bank, a, a, a state, etc., etc., etc. I can foresee a big fight coming on, the, on this. No, no, there, is no, uh, there is no fight. Uh, we, we said it before. Things change faster than we can die. There is, no, there is nobody telling Lee or you that you should use Bitcoin. We can meet in 10 years and then see what happened. Well, and it sort of relates to the question about old and young people and, and bridging Yeah, gaps. they will be because pretty But happy. technology changed very fast, but okay? Be... But the fundamental of economy are, are not allowed to change so fast. I, don't, I, I want to be clear. I'm not against the technology. I'm not against the innovation. But you have to think that, okay, the technology has a very, very high speed. And the example is the high-frequency trader in uh, the financial stock exchange. Okay, but the finance, the fundamental, don't uh, change so fast. And so this is a real problem. You have to face this problem. Um, you, you said, who is using Bitcoin? And 30 years ago, you would have asked, who is using email? Today, but there you are don't pay with 4 email. billion... You don't pay with are, email. There are 4 billion okay. people who have been failed by the banking system and the financial system. Even if they want to, they would not be able to open a bank account. If you are an Indonesian fisherman, you don't have a, 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 a photo ID, you don't have a credit history, maybe you don't even have a birth certificate, 
and there is no way that you can pass the KYC AML uh, requirements of, of, of opening a bank account. So the opportunity is really emancipating billions of people who only need their smartphone to participate as equals in the global scene of trade and commerce and other types of applications that we are going to build. Yes, I understand. But according to me, you have to manage with care. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch it. You have to what? You have to manage with uh, uh, attention. With uh, it's it's uh, it's a it's a bomb. It, it's funny for me sitting between these two sides of the argument because because because. <laughs> but that but that was kind of the point point I was going to make that this has happened so many times. It's happened in organisations where people who didn't have enough of an understanding of the technology have been sold an oversimplified magic wand solution to a whole bunch of problems that were actually about people. And it's made it easier to avoid the problems that were about people. And so I'm just wary about this again. It's a bit like being young and being old, or you know, institutions are struggling to keep up with this, and technologists are sort of enthusiastically rushing ahead. We've got gaps opening up again that will cause well, real problems. In, in New York, for example, institutions were very, very fast. And now in New York, there is a so-called bit license that is a set of requirements for a startup. Uh, before they can, uh, you know, issue Bitcoin or, or open Bitcoin denominated accounts or whatever else. And New York decided to impose compliant, compliance costs on Bitcoin startups that are higher than those of banks. So according to my interpretation, New York just threw the towel and said, it was great to be the financial capital of the world, but now we want to stop. Because the opportunity is for London or Singapore to say, hey, Bitcoin startups, you are welcome. We are not as afraid as New York. And you can show the world what you can do. Uh, you know, in, in, in New York, $280 billion were, went up in smoke in 2008. But the regulators who should be the ones who uh, guarantee that bad things don't happen to people were unable to do anything about it. Nobody went to jail. Nothing happened basically but to anybody. A different uh, situation. Uh, don't uh, um, confuse a different uh, uh, level of discussion. I, I, as I told you before, the problem, the, the, the theoretical problem of Bitcoin is that it has not a reserve value. Because if you pay with a Bitcoin, if you have not, uh, uh, I don't remember how to say, alle spalle. Behind it. Behind, OK, sorry. I'm tired. Uh, behind a, an institution that guarantees the value of this uh, uh, piece of uh, paper uh, or uh, a bit, because uh, now money is only a bit, OK? For me, it's a great problem. It, the risk is very high. I don't, I repeat, I don't want to say that uh, uh, the innovation is bad. I am happy for innovation. I am happy for uh, development of technology. I just only want to say that you have to uh, go step by step, not fast, because technology go fast. But uh, humankind, social uh, uh, behavior don't change so fast. And when uh, I think uh, you use money, that is important, you have to pay more attention. This is only my opinion. Uh, I'd like to zoom out and uh, thinking about our speakers here, uh, I was thinking that uh, the only one who will be very quiet and, and, and happy uh, with bitcoins or euros and dollars is <laughs> Nicola Bienati because we s will still need some gas and oil to, to, to make our showers. So um, th this was a joke, but um, zooming out actually, uh, if we think about the state of the net conferences we had in, in the last years, maybe we, we were chatting about social media and, and how our computers became quicker and how this changed the society. Now we are talking about 
something bigger, in my opinion. And so the ambition uh, of the algorithm era is, is, is bigger. And uh, you do a work with algorithms um, discovering things. Uh, and, and your company uh, did, did build something about uh, the, the, the new mass the discovery la last week, if I'm not wrong. And your part, do you feel unnerved? Like, the, te the technology ones, or h how is your work? Well, I think that in some sense I am an nerd since uh, during the last 10 years uh, I've mainly worked on uh, algorithms and developing software, uh, making it faster, improving the performance, because uh, everything uh, we do is under tight time constraints because of the competition with the other oil companies. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, working in an oil company, I've been privileged compared to, to those who are doing the same work that I'm doing in the academy, because every day I can face the real world problems and I can work side to side with the people that are using my technology, which is very important. Uh, to me, the, the fact that nowadays computers uh, allows uh, a lot of people to test new technology, use the techno new technologies, is a really strong motivation to improve those technologies to make them better. Because uh, if a software is not used, the so that software is dead. If an idea is not used by no one, that idea is dead. If I do something, I can think of a new algorithm that can do something wonderful in my mind. But if the guy who sits uh, on my, uh, next to me, on the desk next to me, he, he, he does not find this algorithm useful to solve the problem that he needs to solve today. My work is, is useless. So for me, the opportunity is uh, to have uh, the possibility of uh, add value to my work, to my everyday job, because people can try to use it, give me feedback, give, give me directions to improve it, to make it more valuable. I'd also like to um, ask Fabrizio Porrino, Vice President of uh, Facility Live, uh, who's going to... Hello? Uh, we were told about uh, your arrival late, so please come. We'll find a, a seat for you. <laughs> Moving. Another man. Please tell us about Facility Live. Uh, All right. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to pass you the greetings of Giampiero Lotito, the founder of Facility Live, and Mauricio Terroni. She's sitting in the back. She's our president and co-founder. Um, I'm here uh, representing, uh, speaking on behalf of Giampiero. Unfortunately, he's in bed with fever, so we couldn't make it. Um, so Facility Live is a new way of understanding uh, the human mind and provide you with um, results that are pertinent to your search on an information domain. Uh, we are at the moment heavily on this, under the, the spotlight of different institutions. Uh, um, I mean, I come from Brussels, just flew from Brussels. Um, we often are um, in touch with people that are not as knowledgeable as this group of people but they still believe, and they ask the very same question about the implication of technology, the economy, the society, the implications. And um, I think, you know, uh, we're doing pretty good. And uh, often you can read about us on newspaper, and there is a tendency, I call it the G-spot syndrome. I know what's G-spot in English, but I use it just to make a joke. <laughs> Because the, you often hear about us in comparison to Big G, you know, who is Big G. Every time you have to Google something, you know who is Big G. And of course, we are flattered. Uh, there is some fundamental truth because our patents in 43 countries worldwide are based uh, on three family of patents. And, um, and among them, there is one that is clearly benchmarking Big G. <laughs> And the U.S. Patents Office says, well, actually, you do a pretty good job, and you kind of are superior <laughs> in some ways. And so um, 
It's very intriguing, it's very fascinating, it's flattering. Uh, but we can tell you it's also even more challenging because we're not in Silicon Valley um, by choice. I mean, I've worked in Silicon Valley before uh, in my previous life. I had many lives, as many people here, I think. Um, we decided, actually, the founder decided to, to do it in Italy, which is, you know, uh, today, I mean, it's not as easy as in other parts of the world, they say. But we're making it. Um, because we think that the implication of technology in society and the economy are also related to where you are based and uh, to the fact that whatever we do and whatever we try to solve with algorithms is basically the reflection of what we see and the reality we see and the problems that are local because, well, I mean, we are used about thinking about global companies and global ways of sorting things. But at the end of the day, I mean, uh, human life is a constant search of solution to problem that I'm facing just in front of me. And that, you know, my, with my body, with my senses, I feel, I touch, I see. And so that's a new way of approaching things, I think. Um, and that's why um, I think we are a story worth telling, and, and people, they want to hear about it. Also because um, I was in front of some student um, the past week uh, at the opening of the academic year of the University of Pavia, with whom we have a lot of strong collaboration at the moment. And basically, well, I was pretty blunt, and I said, you know what, I mean, uh, we want to show that it's possible to do it in Italy because we think that if we can make it, we somehow can save this country if you think this country needs to be saved, I think. Um, and the same approach is, uh, I mean, to what everybody is doing it. We have some global issues. Uh, we have some problem. I mean, we saw what happened today in France. And we somehow have a hint that Technology can help us figure out how complex issues work and how to find solution. However, there are some different approach going around. And I think we, have, we are a bit too much accustomed to an approach whereby you have to destroy everything and rebuild it. Destroy and rebuild it. And this is somehow a way of some algorithm to work. On the other hand, and tomorrow we'll have more time to explain this. Yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> okay, I stop here. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I was. No, no, <laughs> no. This is the subject of the whole conference. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you put me on this. We spot. can work on I'm that. I'm standing. So give a mic. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we'll we'll talk with with you tomorrow uh, in in the afternoon, obviously. Um, I, I'd like to to introduce you, uh, Angelo Gigliano, who's the country manager of eDreams. So please welcome. Welcome to State of the Net. Um, and then if you want to mm, say hi to our audience, then we'll... Uh, <laughs> well, good. Nice to meet you. All right. No, you can say some. <laughs> I was joking. No. Uh, we, uh, I think we, 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 you met our, our speakers, and we... We reached the point we, we were thinking about w with this session. We, we put on a map some keyword that today, that tomorrow will be uh, useful to uh, discover new things and, and may, maybe continue some fights and uh, thinking, that basically thinking uh, about uh, what the future will be. So, as uh, Sergio remembers, we are going to offer you some drinks in, in the square, so I, I, I'm, I hope you can join us. And again, the conference will, will start after this preview tomorrow morning, uh, half past nine, so I, I'm happy and sure that you'll be uh, there with you. Thank you for, for this lovely session and see you tomorrow.